Many people will try and tell you that Python threads are rubbish. That's not true, but you can't use them like you would in most other languages. The GIL or Global Interpreter Lock makes things a little tricky. Use threads the wrong way and you won't actually speed things up. In fact, you might actually slow things down. In this one, I'll show you how to actually use threads in Python, when threads won't help you and might hurt performance, and we'll also go over what most people get wrong about the GIL falling into a really dangerous trap. If you want to code along at home, you can download the code from my Google Drive, a link will be in the description of this video. The code does use NumPy, so you will need to install that in order to use the code. So let's take a look at the main code file, threads.py. So the first thing we do is import two different things. The first one is a timer decorator from Common Decorators. We actually produced this in the last video. And then the second import is a series of different functional weights, IO weight, CPU weight, and CPU weight NumPy. In our main function now, and we declare a list of weights, one second, two seconds, and three seconds. We then loop through this list of weights, and we're basically gonna call the wait function passing in that number of seconds. The main function and all of the wait functions are wrapped with the timer decorator, so each one will be timed. Now, as you can see when we run this, the first wait is coming back after one second, the second one after two seconds, and the third one after three seconds. These all run in series, and so the total amount of time to run main is six seconds. IO waits happen a lot in our day-to-day -day coding. They happen whenever we run a database query, wait on something to come back over a network socket, or even call a service and wait for the response. When these kinds of waits occur in Python, then the GIL is released. So what is the GIL? GIL stands for Global Interpreter Lock, and it's a global serialization mechanism within the interpreter to protect the Python's internal memory structures and reference counters. No matter how many OS threads you kick off in Python, only one of them can execute Python bytecode at any one time. This is why Python threads get a bad name. I've now just swapped out IO wait for CPU wait and run the code again. You'll see that we got the same response. Jumping over to the weights file now, I'm gonna explain how I managed to get CPU weights to take increments of a second. The IO wait is dead easy. I'm just telling the code to sleep for X seconds. In the CPU wait, we're basically looping over and incrementing a number X number of times. That X number has been specifically tuned to ensure that it takes about a second. This number is a constant C iterations per second. In my case, it's 29,300,000 iterations of increments take about one second. I then just times this constant by the number of seconds I want. This second constant here, C array size modifier, is the array size I'm using in NumPy for my code to take around a second. This creates an array size based on that number times by the number of seconds. This will contain a number of integers from one to one minus that number. We then run through that array, square each of the numbers and sum them together. To tune these numbers on your machine, if your machine it takes longer than a second to run the code, then shorten those numbers. Otherwise, increase them. And just tune these up and down until you get roughly where you wanna be. Once you've got that tuned, we'll go back to the main code and then we're gonna change it to implement threading and show how these different kinds of weights perform when we try and multi-thread them. The code for threading in Python is in the threading module. So from threading, import thread. And then we need to wrap each of our weight calls in a thread. Now to marshal each of the threads correctly, you need a reference point to that thread. You could either do T1 equals thread wait one second, T2 equals thread wait two seconds, or we can do a loop and create them that way into a list. I'm gonna use a list comprehension to do this. So here's my list comprehension, IO wait X for X in weights. We're just gonna run this now without threading, and you'll see that it runs exactly as it did as if it was in a loop. And now we change the beginning of the list comprehension to wrap this IO wait X in a thread. So we create an instance of the thread class, and the target parameter is going to be a reference to our function. So IO wait in this case. Note that I'm not putting brackets at the end of IO wait. That would pass a function call and not a function reference. Our second parameter is going to be called args, and this takes a tuple of the parameters we would pass to our function. So in this case, we're going to do open brackets, x, comma, close brackets. The comma's there to say this is a tuple. Let's run this now and see what happens. Okay, so you'll see that main took zero seconds and the program finished. Whilst we created our threads, we didn't tell them to do anything. To get them to actually do something, we need to tell them to start. You can do this in a loop. I'm just gonna do it in another list comprehension. So for thread in threads, call the start method on the thread object. And let's run it just to see what it does. This may surprise you. You'll see that our main function completes in zero seconds, but instead of the program finishing like it did last time, now you see each of the threads running. One second, two seconds, and three seconds. 
then the program finishes. How can main finish when the code inside it hasn't finished running? Well, technically speaking, what you asked it to do has been done. You asked it to spin up a load of threads and send work to them, which is exactly what it did. Calls to thread.start do not block. If they did, you couldn't start a second thread until the first thread had finished running. They literally start the thread and yield back to the code. Now, what if after you've run your threads, you want to do something with the data that those threads processed? That's actually quite easy. We just need to tell the code to pause until the thread completes. To wait for a thread to complete, you simply call join on the thread. This will wait for each thread in sequence to complete before it goes to the next one. So I'm just going to change my comment that says do some work here that relies on the above to a print statement so we can see it run in sequence. And then we're going to rerun the code. And now we get the three IO wait functions running. One second, two seconds, three seconds. We then print our do some work here that relies on the above. And then main took three seconds. We basically just took six seconds of work and made it finish in three seconds. We did this by running that work in parallel. As the total time to run all the threads in parallel was as long as the longest running thread, we had 100% efficiency. That means that the guild didn't affect us at all. If your Python code does a lot of waiting around, waiting on external resources such as database calls, URLs or sockets, then threading is a perfect way to speed up that code. Now let's try a CPU bound kind of wait, where the code is constantly busy doing CPU processing. So all we need to do for this is change our IO wait as the target to CPU wait. And you'll see now our first wait call that used to take a second when we ran it in series, takes a whopping 2.6 seconds when you run it in parallel. Why? Because all the code are running in threads in the same interpreter, the gill is stopping that code from running so that other threads can get it go. Remember the gill's job is to stop two lines of bytecode running at the same time. It is this pausing and switching that's making those threads take longer to run. And you'll see that main finished in 5.8 seconds, which is almost as much as if we'd run them in series. It is this behavior that gives threading such a bad name in Python. CPU bound tasks written in Python are really not a good candidate for threading. They will either take about the same amount of time or even longer because thread marshalling adds overhead. So if your code is pure Python and is purely CPU based, do not use threads in Python. It's just not worth it. The third use case I'm going to show you is where we're doing CPU computational heavy tasks, but we're doing them in C modules. In well-written C modules, once code execution passes to them, they have control over the gill and they can release it. NumPy is one of those modules that does lots of number crunching. If we run a NumPy example by changing CPU wait to CPU wait NumPy and run it again, you'll see that all of those threads complete and the main took 3.9 seconds. So if your code does call C modules, it's worth calling some of those calls in parallel if you can to speed your program up. Note that results may vary based on the C module because remember the C module has control of the gill and it will only release it if it's thread safe to do so. While I was talking, I've been changing the code to run CPU weight NumPy directly so you can actually see it does take intervals of a second-ish. The scariest misconception about Python threads is this. Only one thread can execute bytecode at a time, so that must mean my code is thread safe, right? Wrong. I've heard this numerous times and it's simply not true. Believing it will lead you to write some really nasty, hard to track down bugs. The gill only protects low level memory management inside the interpreter. It's not there to protect you from race conditions or corrupting shared state. If two threads try to modify shared data like incrementing a counter or building a result set, you can still end up with broken, inconsistent results. Some operations might even work most of the time until they don't, which is why race conditions are so problematic to debug. Let me show you just what this can cause. Here I have a really simple piece of code. It's practically what we've used throughout the examples. I'm basically just calling IO wait in nine different threads, each taking one second. This means that most of them will try and print the time at the same time. Now let's see what happens when we run it. I'm guessing that this is not what you expected to happen. The text is all over the place. Sometimes there's loads of it on one line and then you've got loads of big gaps. This is because the printing of the text and the printing of the new line is not atomic. They happen using different bytecode. Also printing to the screen causes an IO wait, which means a thread is far more likely to yield control to another. It's this IO wait that makes this example so obvious. It means that in most cases, another thread will start to execute before the new line is written. How do we go about starting to fix this? First, we need to work out where the print statement's happening, and then let's go to that code. It's in the decorators file. And then we need to import the lock class from the threading module. So from threading, import lock. We then wrap a context manager around our print statement, so with lock. 
This basically says, while the code in the context manager is running, no other thread can get access to this log, so it will not be able to print at the same time. Or at least that's the theory. Let's try and run this. And you'll see that nothing has changed, it's still broken. This is a common bug I get from developers new to threading. The lock object must be shared between all threads. And here what we're doing is actually creating a brand new lock object each time we run the decorator. To create a global lock, all we need to do is create a variable outside of the decorator, and we're gonna call it global lock, and we're gonna instantiate a lock object. And then we just replace the lock in our context manager with global lock. And if we run this, it all completes perfectly. I hope you've learned a lot from this video, the good, the bad, and the ugly of Python threads. If you have, then why not leave a like or even subscribe? It will help this channel grow and best of all, it's free. And with that, thanks for watching and I hope to catch you on the next one.